Hi everyone, Michelle Ferrer here, Member of Parliament for Peterborough Kawartha, and thank you for joining us. This is our 10th episode, so yay! <laughs> a huge milestone. Um, people before politics. So for those of you who've been following along, this, uh, this series was really intended to connect with people, to learn about individual stories, what happened to people who are now in politics to shape their political uh, beliefs and who they are today. And it's also to give people the human side, right? In a world of social media, in a world where it's very easy to attack and to assume, it is really important that we learn who people are. Because once we have a connection, we're like, okay, I can understand your perspective. And understanding everybody's kind of side allows us to have more democracy, really, because we're able to listen better. So that's really the premise uh, behind People Before Politics. If you're watching this, I would really ask you, um, if you're watching this on Facebook, to share it. Um, in the last little bit, we've uh, seen the algorithm change yet again, and um, we're seeing that they're actually muting some of uh, political posts. So we would ask for your organic help to share this post. It really helps us in, in getting more information out and engaging with people and educating people. So we would appreciate that, and thank you very much for doing that. So very excited. This was <laughs> one of um, the guests that I've wanted to have on since the day I started, uh, Senator Denise Bad. <laughs> and her resume and bio, I have to tell you, um, Emily from my office wrote in brackets, I just want to say it was really hard to shorten this bio because she's done so much and it's all so great. No. And it's no lie, like it's, it is pages <laughs> long of your accomplishments. And so I think instead of reading this, I would love to sort of just summarize what I've seen and know about you. Because the senators, Denise, first of all, you're our first senator to be on the show. We've oh, had MPs, awesome. but Thank we haven't you. had a senator. And the Senate is a really interesting concept. Like a lot of people don't really know much yep. about the Senate. What's fascinating, what you told me, was that from the time you were 12, <laughs> you wanted to be a senator. Yes, yes. Which what I, did you even know about the Senate <laughs> at 12 and why? I know, it's a very unusual thing to want to be. I understand that um, <laughs> well, from the time cool. you're 12. Yeah, um, yeah I, I mean, I'm, I'm of the age that when I was a kid, here was my typical Saturday night, what I liked to do. Um, I, the first show on TV that I liked to watch was This Week in Parliament. Oh, wow. Then, then it was Hockey Night in Canada. And then uh, I would usually convince, try to convince my mom, oh yeah, no, I really want to watch Tommy Hunter because I wanted to stay up to watch Wayne and Schuster. So that was kind of the typical Saturday night. So yeah, politics, I was always interested in the news. I also wanted to be a lawyer from the time I was probably 10, and I did, I did that. I'm still a practicing lawyer, but not active now that I'm in the Senate. Um, but uh, yeah, so it was something I actually, I found that the Senate would probably be the best combination of law and politics. Mm. And it was always interested in the news, always interested in politics. I know my dad said one time that from the time I was a little kid, like I would read the newspaper cover to cover and just always interested in current events. Um, I'm from Saskatchewan, so um, you know, it was interesting that at the time I was a little kid, Pierre Trudeau was the prime minister, and my dad was a farm equipment dealer. We lived in Regina, or I'm a city kid, but um, agriculture was obviously important to my mm -hmm. province and to, um, to my family. And uh, so I knew from the time I was very young that uh, I was a conservative wow. and I did not like the Trudeaus. And so isn't it interesting now that now we have his son as prime minister, which even my very meek and mild aunt told me a couple of years ago, you know, you have to get rid of him. <laughs> like he's even worse than his dad. And I, I was just shocked that she would have said something like that. But I remember a very early uh, a family trip, my very, favorite hockey team was the New York Islanders, which were winning Stanley Cups when I was a kid. And so the very first time I got to, uh, we took a road trip to Winnipeg to watch the New York Islanders play live. Um, I, I thought it was maybe the best day I had ever had in my life because we were driving to Winnipeg. It was, it was leap year day, 1984. And I remember that day because as we were driving to Winnipeg, going to watch my very favorite team play for the first time live, they announced over the radio that Pierre Trudeau had taken his walk in the snow and he was quitting as prime minister. And I said, this is the best day that could possibly <laughs> exist. And how old are you? I was 13. <laughs> oh my God. I think that's yeah. fascinating too. And I know like Saskatchewan is the only caucus that is all conservative yes. like it is it is very a very blue yes very blue 14 province. out of 14 yeah, conservative so mps yes that's not shocking to hear to right. hear that to hear that system so mm -hmm. as a senator yeah 
what do you do? Mm -hmm. Like if you were to put it in layman's terms for right. people at home versus MPs. Right. Because a lot of people don't know this. I can't go in to the Senate. Yeah, you can only sit at the back and yeah. there's a bar actually yes. that they, they have that separates you from um, and that's and a historical thing, right? And you can't go in. No, I can go. Well, yes. you can come into yes, us, but we can't go in there. It's like we're the upper house or whatever historically, right. so we can go. And in fact, uh, you know, President Biden will be here um, on Friday. Yep. And this is uh, when when senators sit, at, when somebody addresses parliament, like I was there for President Zelensky to do the video address mm -hmm. in February. And senators actually sit in the middle of the floor mm -hmm. of the House of Commons. So we're able to go there. But MPs, when so if you were to come to watch a throne speech or something like that, I did. you can come, but you have I to stood, sit at the I back, at the behind back. the bar. Yeah. It's a historical thing it just neat, based actually. on, yeah, parliamentary, Westminster parliamentary tradition. And it's mm -hmm. because the House of Commons, right, that's the common, representing the common people. And historically, the Senate was representing, you know, the land landowners and that sort of thing. It's evolved mm -hmm. since then. Now it's more of representing regions, um, disadvantaged groups, you know, um, those types of things, um, minority groups. But also, I would say the most important part that the Senate plays is as the chamber of sober second thought. You often hear that. And that's because at every piece of legislation that passes Parliament, there's two houses of Parliament, the House of Commons and the Senate. And it has to pass both of those in the exact same format in order to be a law. So after it's generally the practice that the House of Commons considers a bill first, goes through all the stages there, eventually passes or gets amended or things like that, then comes to the Senate and then we do usually a more intensive um, review of a bill because we don't, we have a longer term view. We're generally, we are appointed at the system that exists right now. Mm -hmm. Many of us would like to see a change, but that is the system that exists, is that senators are appointed by the prime minister, not elected. So we have a longer term view. We're generally there longer than MPs, may have a particular um, interest or expertise mm -hmm. in certain areas. So usually our committee study bills for longer. We debate them generally longer and with more hours and put in kind of the intensive work to make sure that a bill is as good as it can be, or at least very important concerns are drawn to the attention of the public before a bill is passed. And I don't want to get too far down the weeds of a civics class for everybody, but it is interesting because I, I think that what I really want to talk to Denise about today is, is mental health, and, and we're going to get to that. And mm -hmm. But before we do, because she has a very powerful story um, of her former husband, well, he's your husband. I guess that's a tough one to late say, husband. right? Your yeah. late husband. Yeah. Um, but this, the Senate still has quite a bit of controversy around it because sure. when you were elected, this is what yeah. you were saying to me, yeah. you were, or sorry, you weren't elected, you're appointed. Right. Um, appointed by uh, former Prime Minister Stephen Harper. Yes. 2013, and like two weeks after you were elected, that was when all of the things about the Senate became. Right. The Senate expense scandal happened. Yes. And like kind of broke wide open two weeks after I got there. And so, you know, I, I say I, that I had. your 12 year old <laughs> self's decision. <laughs> well, I had kind of two days of peace of being actually sitting in the Senate and then the third day one of my former colleagues you know was getting arrested I was watching getting ready watching him get arrested on uh, on TV so yeah that was quite the thing um, and that lasted for a while but uh, you know it just but re reaffirmed my desire to be there and also to let people know that there was a lot of good that was happening there despite the bad things that everyone was seeing on the on the press and also I've kind of trying to take it upon myself occasionally to make sure that people understand more about the Senate mm -hmm. and what we can do and the important role that we can have. And I always, I mean, a really important part of our role is sticking up for our regions. And uh, so I always view that that is a really important thing for me, as well as, you know, getting into the mental health aspect mm -hmm. too. It gives us a national platform to be able to, um, to speak to people and also really do some good work on some really key important issues of national importance. Yeah, you know, it's these uh, interviews, the unintended consequences, they kind of reinvigorate me because it's very much a peaks and valleys uh, job yeah. uh, and way of life. It's not really a job, it's, mm -hmm. it's like your life lifestyle, but it, you do sometimes get, oh, like everything is so slow and bureaucratic mm -hmm. and then you, you get frustrated, but it's funny when I interview seasoned MPs or mm -hmm. yourself, it, you kind of bring me back, you're like, no, yes, there's bad, but there's also good and right. it's hard and you're always trying to push and pull and, and sort of move the needle because 
something significant usually brought you here, right? There's yeah. something like a compass that drives most people that are elected to, to change, right? Right, exactly. So I think that's interesting. But if I can, mm -hmm. um, I think I think your story of, of your late husband, mm -hmm. uh, Dave, is a very, very powerful story. And you're so um, courageous and open about mm -hmm. the story. And I think it's helped a lot of people. And it's mm -hmm. brought a lot of... Um, light to a topic that's that's that needs to be talked about yeah. so he was an MP he was a conservative MP he first got elected in 2004 and he always referred to it as a calling because he wanted also to be an MP or an MLA from the time he was uh, you two were a two kid in a pod, I know eh? we were and yeah. then we actually met crossing the street at a, polit a political convention when I was 19 and he was 20 so sort of destined uh, that we would meet and um, then started seriously dating and uh, ended up married and um, yeah when Dave first started to run it was right when the parties the alliance and the um, cons and the progressive conservative party were merging mm. and Dave decided to run and a big part that drove him to run then was actually I had I was a lawyer at the time and my legal assistant was murdered by her ex-husband wow. and Dave wanted to do something to make that system better and he this guy got out on bail um, which you know is a huge topic now mm -hmm. and still hasn't been rectified at all um, even despite the fact that he you know had threatened he had seriously assaulted this woman and um, and then threatened to kill her and then did kill her when he got out on bail and shouldn't have probably ever been let out on bail but the judge didn't know the facts of the case so Dave actually brought a private members bill forward and right before he had to retire because of his significant mental health issues in 2008 his bill had was just on he had just debated it at second reading that was the last speech mm. that he ever gave in parliament was about that and then his colleagues as you know often after a um, someone's second reading speech, um, then the colleagues would um, give, give their speeches as well. And it was really touching, actually, because they were almost sort of tributes to Dave and the work mm -hmm. that he had done. And it had widespread support, this bill. So it's something that, you know, that topic still needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that was what drove Dave to be, to run for MP at that time. And he just really felt like he wanted to make a difference. He was a pharmaceutical rep. He had a very good job. Um, but he wanted to, he always wanted to, um, be an MP at some point in his life. That seemed like an excellent time. The parties were merging. Um, he had this significant personal issue that he wanted to pursue. And uh, he was a member of parliament. He won in 2004, won again in 2006 by a considerably larger margin. And then unfortunately started to struggle with some serious um, anxiety and depression issues you know, really only about in the last year and a half of his life. And then there was an election in the fall of 2008 and one of the most difficult decisions he had to make, that was when he was really struggling and he had to decide at the time of that election that he wasn't, he wanted to try to regain his health. So he decided not to run again and called Prime Minister Harper and told him that he, you know, thought that was the best for mm -hmm. him and his family. And uh, so he, uh, but he was very, he, uh, you know, you say that I was courageous. He, Dave started it because when he decided not to run again, he put out a press release saying why he was not running that, again. And that, and like what year was that? Was that was 2008. That's a huge, it was huge deal. two years before the first Bell Let's yeah. Talk day. So nobody was talking about mental health then. Um, and this was someone who was currently suffering with mental health issues and was a current MP. So, you know, at the time there were some people who had come out, said, oh yeah, the, you know, 10 years ago I struggled with this, but I'm all good now. Dave was currently struggling and he put out a press release That's to say that deal. he was struggling with this. And, and I have people that still to this day come up to me and tell me that because he put out that press release, that's why they decided to get help. And so that was huge. So Dave's story, mm -hmm. he, he did die by suicide, yes, which is a year awful. later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was he ill? Like what led up to recognizing those signs? Had he yeah. always struggled? He probably had a very <laughs> low level of anxiety always all his life. He was a high achiever, a perfectionist, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so, but, uh, you know, the lifestyle of an MP is a difficult mm -hmm. one. And 
it was something that, uh, you know, we live in Saskatchewan, it's on a good day, it's a six hour sort of flight situation, because um, never anything direct, and, uh, you know, changing time zones twice a week, and with the first election he won, he won by 124 votes. Oh, that's a tight one. Yeah, extremely tight, and it was minority governments for the entire time that he was an MP. They were always getting geared up for an election. It was very stressful. He was someone that did not want to fail once mm. having succeeded, so he won by significant margin the second time, 3,500 votes, and probably oh. in 2008, had he chosen to run again, he probably would have won by 10,000 wow. votes. But uh, so he was a very popular MP, he did a great job, he was very concerned about his constituents, and that was part of the reason that he decided to be honest about why he wasn't going to run again. Not only did he think that it could help people, but he thought that his constituents deserved to know why he wasn't going to run again. Um, so he, yeah, he was just a very conscientious person, did a great job as MP, was very um, outgoing person. He was the kind of person, and I think it illustrates why it's important to talk about mental health issues and that it is a health issue. It's not a personality flaw or uh, because anyone that would have known Dave or looked at him wouldn't have thought, oh yeah, that guy um, struggles with mental health issues. I mean, because he was, cheerful and outgoing and you know always had a joke um, he was kind of you know the team the team spirit guy in mm -hmm. caucus apparently um, and uh, yet despite that he struggled with mental health issues so that does that shows you that it is not a personality issue or mm -hmm. something like that someone who is always down in the dumps or whatever and it it's not necessarily always a mask when someone is smiling when they have mental illness it could just be the fact that they have this health issue and you can happy outgoing people have it too it's funny you know I'm thinking about this and I probably should have said this at the beginning if there is a trigger warning or something for people because listening or talking about suicide is not is not easy for ever anyone or for many people and it's a struggle if, if you've recently lost somebody mm -hmm. but I remember you know in 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 my travels of, of hearing it described as suicide is a disease mm -hmm. because there's it's the disease of the brain like I liked that that example because people would say to me what a selfish thing to do I've heard that and mm -hmm. we still need to pull back that stigma because it's it's not yeah. a conscious rational choice right. imagine being yes. so in ill that mm -hmm. state right exactly and I and I think we still need to have that conversation for people to understand and that's a I liked that way of describing it's a virus in your brain yeah. yeah and so if you know if something is telling you that that's not okay and you need you need to call for help which is a great segue to what yeah. you've been able to accomplish here in terms of what you've advocated for yeah. for help so you want to talk about that right absolutely and I just was thinking as you were speaking about that to um, when Dave died by suicide I decided to be open about that and yes. to um, put out a press release saying that and then at Dave's funeral Prime Minister Harper actually came to Dave's funeral and gave a speech about depression and suicide mm -hmm. and that was the first time I think any national leader worldwide had talked about something like that so openly but he also talked about Dave because sometimes when people struggle with mental illness they die by suicide their entire life becomes just consumed by their death that's right and Stephen Harper didn't want Dave to be That's remembered wonderful. like that. He talked about what a great colleague May was, their life great always friend. Always be bigger than their death. That Absolutely. Was, that's a powerful yeah, for thing. sure. Yeah. And Stephen Harper, in this speech, which I later heard, you know, I had psychology professors coming up to me and telling me that they actually use Stephen Harper's speech in their classes to show their classes um, how you know important it was to speak so openly about it but he talked he had a great line in there and I may not quote it correctly but it's something like Dave's death kind of illustrated to him that suicide cares not how much you have to live for um, because you know we had a very happy life right we had you know, he had a successful career, um, you know, good family, things like that, um, but he was ill. And yes, uh, yes, yeah, and I think a lot of times people who are struggling, they're, they're not trying to be selfish. They feel like they're a burden to everyone. Mm -hmm. And this is how they're, they go into a bit of a tunnel vision where they think that everyone would be better off without them. And of course, those of us who are left behind, we would never want mm -hmm. that to be the case we would always want that person to be there and to continue to fight for them and to advocate exactly. for them and and try to get them healthy and I still despite the tragedy of the story 
the reason I guess I have kind of taken that up after Dave's death and, you know, spoken nationwide to people and done so much media about this and um, Dave's friends came to me about a year after he died to uh, say that we should have a golf tournament in Dave's memory and I thought that was a great idea. So we decided to have that and then I had several of them and raised more than $200,000 and all the money that we raised went to um, produce and broadcast a TV commercial that we broadcast in Saskatchewan and we still you know, have it uh, um, which focused on particularly men, because middle-aged men are the most likely to complete suicide. Um, they struggle with, with mental illness, they, especially you know, when we started this 12 years ago or so, they don't talk about it enough or they don't seek help for it and then they choose more lethal means and die by suicide three times more often than women do. So um, it's really important to talk about it. If you need help, please seek help. It's okay you know, to ask for help. So true, and I think where the, the gap is, there's two things I wanna say out of all that you just said. Number one, your, your language is so critical, and if you're picking up on it, you, you'll recognize neither one of us have ever said committed. Yes. Um, it's died by suicide, and mm -hmm. it is a very small language, but it matters greatly because committed in, implies, and this is where your legal background comes yeah. in, it was illegal. Right. You were a criminal. Right. And so we really have to be mindful and also use the word completed. Mm -hmm. um, these are little tiny language changes that change how we frame and think about the disease of mm -hmm. suicide. Mm -hmm. And so I think that those are really key things. The second thing I think is um, talking about it, the, the people you cannot help um, in terms of prevention from suicide are those that you do not know are thinking about it. Right. So by not talking about it or asking, which is a really hard conversation for mm -hmm. people and you may not be the right person, but finding someone. Mm -hmm. Which takes me to my third point of yeah. we can sit and tell everybody to go seek help, but the problem so desperately in our country right now is that the access to help yes. is is weightless where people actually are dying. Exactly, yeah. So how do we fix that, yeah. Senator? And that's the thing that I've been continually trying to advocate for. Not only do I advocate for more people talking about it, but I've been consistent in you know, um, advocating that we need more help mm -hmm. across the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, when, when Stephen Harper was the Prime Minister, we, that he, he was, our government was very involved in forming the Mental Health Commission of Canada, who's mm -hmm. done some great work on this. And our government actually did a lot of things on mental health. And you know, the current government, I don't know how political we want to get here, but uh, they're, <laughs> they're big talkers, but they don't, they don't do a lot. Um, you know, they, in the last election, they promised a Canada mental health transfer of $4.5 billion over five years. Well, um, I asked Christian Freeland, the finance minister, about it last fall. I said, you're already $875 million behind because they actually had it costed out year by year how much they were going to spend. And now they're $1.5 billion behind. So we'll see if it's in her budget next week, but where's the money been? And, uh, you know, they like to talk about these things. I mean, our colleague Todd Doherty and many of us were very involved in pushing for the three digit suicide prevention hotline. Um, and it took them so long, like more than two years, I think it was, it or something like that. No, by the end of this year, it's supposed to be. So yeah. we will continue to push. But yes, as far as the, the healthcare system in general and how it treats mental health, there's many good things that are happening in pockets across the country. Um, I was very involved prior to um, going to the Senate to help our conservative colleague, um, Harold Albrecht, pass a Suicide Prevention Framework Act that's supposed to be very operational and helping across the country. The Liberals have really done almost nothing with it. It makes me quite furious, mm. but uh, at the same time, there are many different things that need to be done, but we need to continue to make sure that they are done. And believe me, I've seen the significant gaps that we've had in our mental health care system firsthand. Dave suffered because of many of those gaps, but the solution is to fix the system, not to, as the Trudeau government is trying to do right now and is right now delaying for one year, but their intention is to only delay it to allow people, shockingly, suffering with mental illness to receive medical aid in dying, um, medically assisted suicide to help kill these people. Um, it's, 
it's something that I just can't even fathom because these are people that need help and treatment and are promised that we will never give up on them because they've given up on themselves too often. That's right. It's mm -hmm. really well said. It's a very passionate job. I mean, we could, I feel like we need another three hours. <laughs> I, I really do because there's so much to unpack here in terms of what, what we can do differently, what we can do better. But the maid issue, I think, like what a message to send. Mm -hmm. One thing that I would love to leave people with, Denise, if you're, if you're comfortable with, is mm -hmm. the impact on the family and the friends mm -hmm. of the person struggling. I yeah. feel like that's a really missing component when we look at access to care as well. There's treatment and recovery, and I look at it very much similar to addiction in mm -hmm. a lot of ways. It is. Because you can, you can help the person struggling with the addiction and help them, but if the people around them also don't know what language or triggers or tools or how to best support them and support themselves, yes. because the toll this took on you. Absolutely, yes. And, and does, and I mean, mm -hmm. that's why I say, I, I sometimes feel so guilty when you have, you have to continue to hang on to this mm -hmm. torch. It's, that's a big burden. It's a big burden that you lost him mm -hmm. and then now you have to keep reliving it every mm -hmm. time that's what I always say about you know when we talk about truth and reconciliation mm -hmm. we expect these people who've been through so much to keep resharing their story and it's like we've got to we've got to help mm -hmm. but how do we help the family and friends um, if somebody's out there what what did you need well, I, I had a great family and friends that supported me, and uh, including my political family, you know, including Dave's colleagues um, in the Conservative Caucus were always so great, both before I came to the Senate and then and since then. You know, I have many good friends that uh, I had I've had for many years. Um, I mean, Dave and Andrew Shear and Pierre Polyev were all in the same caucus elected together in 2004. And uh, so the, I was fortunate to have wonderful people like that who helped me and supported me through it. But yes, it takes a big toll on the family members and close friends of these people because you're doing everything you can to be kind of head cheerleader, right, for a long time. Um, to just convince that person that no, you know, we'll try this, this will work, you know, we'll try this and to keep their spirits up and to keep some hope alive for them, it's very difficult and it's also very difficult um, for a caregiver to take care of an ill person and so you have to take time for yourself to just try to take care of yourself as best you can because it's difficult to stay healthy yourself. Um, so yeah, that's very important. But um, I wanted to say too about the addiction issue. Yeah, Dave also had to overcome a significant drug dependency on prescription medication, benzodiazepines. So addiction and mental illness are very tied together. They're, they're like cousins. And I think it's important that when people are um, dealing with these issues that they're recognizing the close ties that exist there and often people are self-medicating with prescriptions or alcohol or behaviors or things like that so that's often a really important part of it and that's why it's important med maybe medication only isn't the answer maybe people need counseling but just reach out to um, your family and friends and uh, and to medical professionals who can help you they people want to help um, but do. it's it's really important I guess if I can leave people with one message about this whole the Liberal government right now has put off for one year um, assisted suicide for mental illness. Please let your Liberal members of Parliament know that the Liberal government should back down entirely on this. The science is not there. Mental illness is not irremediable. It is treatable. And I say this even though my situation with my husband ended in tragedy, but I don't want other people's to end up in tragedy. And there is help out there for people. Uh, it may take a lot of time, but hopefully we can help as many people as we can. Well said, great, great, mm -hmm. great way to end it. And I think the one thing I would point out about what I see that you do is you share. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very powerful. Not all people are capable, or they're, they're not all people have that ability to communicate their feelings and to, to, to own them or to share them. Some people just, they can't get it from here to here. Yeah. But I think that's very helpful when you open up to people. You said it really well. Most people, human nature is they actually want to help, mm -hmm. you know? So, and even if, I think people are really always worried they're gonna say the wrong thing, right. or because it's awkward and oh my gosh, what if I, and I think 
you know, you being so open and candid makes it so much easier. So I, I think, you know, give yourself credit in that regard. Too. Oh, well, thank you so much. And thank you for having, you know, me on this show to talk about this. Uh, admired you for a long time. I was so happy when you won that election. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, really pleased to serve you with you in this caucus. And uh, you bring in a very important perspective and with all your hard work on these important topics. And yeah, let's keep talking about this. Let's Absolutely. Let's keep doing it. Uh, if you want to follow Senator Batters, um, she also shares great fashion as well. Uh, one of <laughs> on her, Instagram. One of her <laughs> healthy uh, coping mechanisms, I would say, are her love of shoes. shoes. Um, and man, she never disappoints. Every Wednesday when we have caucus, I, uh, what shoes does she have on? And it's uh, it's a great little um, balance in a world of so so much heaviness to right. to see that you're always you always look so great and well, so well. Thank together. you. I'm new to Instagram, but yeah, I have my Facebook, Senator Denise Batters, and uh, Twitter at Denise Batters and also on Instagram so yeah. so she's a she's a powerhouse um, she mm -hmm. has accomplished so much and her bio is pages long mm -hmm. um, but I think um, your fierceness in bringing an awareness to an to a subject that literally impacts every single person Absolutely. without a doubt yep. it is it is a universal um, issue it is mental health so Denise Batters, thank you so much for your work. Thank you for being here. Thank you guys so much for watching this episode of People Before Politics. Make sure you like, comment, share. You can find this on any platform where you can listen or watch. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next time.